Good afternoon. My name is David Foster. I'm the chair of the Society of American Military Engineers Geospatial Engineering Working Group. Uh, thank you for joining us today, taking time out of your, your busy schedules to uh, listen to these two great Americans talk about uh, health engineering and their use of geospatial intelligence and preparedness, response, and recovery to natural disasters. A little bit of housekeeping for us. You can read the top line there. So anybody that's on VPN, uh, that applies to you. Please check your speakers or your audio system and turn up the volume as appropriate. There is a chat tab on the control panel uh, that you may submit technical issues to and a private tab for your response. We do actually have used the chat for submitting your questions and potentially receiving some answers to those, but primarily we'll be using those questions in that chat uh, to drive the Q&A session at the end of the session. If you're interested in the handouts tab to download a copy of the presentation, please feel free to do that. And also be aware that Sammy will put out a notification uh, of where the, the video can be viewed in the future. So for many of you who have mission partners who this, this certainly will add value to their, their kit bag, uh, please think about sharing that in the future once Sammy reaches out to you with that information. We're gonna start with a poll question and this is gonna stay open uh, for a few minutes just to see who we have on the line and the, the target audience here that we're, we're speaking to. Our first presenter is John Gilreath. He was born in Washington, DC, and has applied his love of maps to a variety of fields. He currently resides in Gainesville, Florida as DRMP's GIS manager, working with the USA Space Force. Oh, did I see the Gators thing going on? You saw on a chomp, you saw a chomp, yeah. <laughs> He's working with the US Space Forces. Uh, he didn't say that in advance. Now I have to drop him off. Uh, US Navy in the University of Florida, and other premier institutions and agencies across the nation. His previous emergency response experience includes Hurricane Katrina in 2005, Tropical Storm Allison in 2001, 9-11, and ICS Planning Section Chief for the City of Gainesville, Florida. Our second speaker, Captain Derek Chandler, is the Element Chief for Radiation and Readiness at Joint Base Andrews. He has served in several roles related to emergency response and health risk communication to commanders. In addition, he has served on the Joint Service COVID-19 Operations Cell at Triple Army Medical Center, where he was responsible for coordinating Air Force contact tracing efforts, relaying operations information to leadership, and developing PPE standard operating procedures. Furthermore, he completed an internship at the Department of Health and Human Services in Nebraska, where he supported the development of a GIS dashboard to assist first responders identifying medical facilities and delivering patients for appropriate medical treatment. His educational background is biomedical engineering and biostatistics, where he practices statistical computing in identifying and predicting health hazards in workplaces and surrounding communities. Again, two great uh, Americans, great patriots, uh, experiences that uh, we'll hear about today. So. With that, I'm going to just briefly review the, the, or let you review the learning objectives and then hand it over to John to kick off the, the formal part of the presentation. So, so thank you. Thank you, David. And I have to thank you for all the work that you have done for the GeoWorks community. You've been invaluable for all of us and the work you've done putting this together. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to today go through a lot. We're going to talk about some resources for data. We're going to talk about some of the um, frameworks that exist right now. We're going to talk about some case studies and some examples. Um, a lot of this will be health driven, um, but really, you know, the major takeaways can be data can apply to anything. Um, these data frameworks exist to support your mission. We're going to give you those frameworks and resources. Uh, a major takeaway is that your mission requirements drive your data collection. Um, you may have specific requirements to your installation or your region, 
and one fit may not be the same for everybody, but if you follow the framework, if you use these resources, you're going to be able to have a customized response and a customized data set for your responses. Data is an asset and we should treat it as such. Um, you need to enable these assets and your personnel that involves funding identifying funding, identifying your personnel. Some of the things that we've been talking about as we put this together are, you know, you may not have a geospatial expert in your realm, in your branch, on your base. Um, so reach out to the folks who do. Um, CE is a huge part of this. So AVCAC, NAVFAC, those folks can help you. If you provide the data, they can also bring you the, the uh, analysis and the platform for completing your mission. Second thing is uh, you need to build, or the last thing is build your relationships early with external agencies, people on your base, um, local resources, and higher up the framework. Build your geospatial data set early. Don't wait until an impending disaster or if something happens, you'll spend your first four days piecing that data together. You want to be able to respond proactively and ahead of time. So just a, a brief, you know, brief overview of the overall stages, you know, of preparation and planning, the actual response, and then the recovery. And geospatial data is integral to each stage. Um, you may have data that is site specific or you may not. It's not always necessary for a larger region, but if you're looking at an isolated incident, it's good to have that data. These are some of the frameworks that exist. You know, um, my bio mentioned that I was an ICS section planning chief, so we dealt a lot with briefings, with preliminary damage assessment, with reporting, um, and that all exists within the national response framework. And specifically um, for health services, you know, it's ESF3, six and eight. We also have resources listed and these have hyperlinks available to you um, when you receive the recording and the PowerPoint of this presentation, but they're available for Homeland Security, Health Services, the FEMA Geospatial Resource Center, USA Structures. The list goes on and on and on and we'll talk about some of the more local resources down the road, but there is a national framework. Resources do exist. Um, it's important to make your personnel aware of these. You may not have a professional geospatially trained expert um, under your command, so it's important to know that these resources exist and make sure that they're distributed throughout the team. I'm going to pass it over to Derek now to talk a little bit about what the Air Force is doing with this framework and data. Awesome. Thanks, John. Good morning, everyone, or actually good afternoon now. So, yes, uh, I, one thing I want to highlight on this, so what John just uh, brought up earlier was like building those relationships and getting that geospatial data set, you know, early just to implement. So for the Air Force, geospatial data is nothing new. It's uh, not necessarily the most novel thing, but for what we are performing in uh, health engineering perspective, such as in OCH Health or uh, environmental health, we're partnering up with our civil engineering uh, counterparts and essentially interlinking uh, two systems that we have. So uh, we have the Defense Occupational and Environmental Readiness System, or we call it DOORS for short. And uh, that is what bioenvironmental engineering uses to actually upload our data and capture all uh, potential exposures and um, securing uh, that information that can be utilized uh, later down the line uh, in a geo uh, in a geospatial uh, dashboard. And then civil engineering uses what is called the Air Force Geospatial Integration Management System or AFGIMS. And really right now what we are doing is we actually created, we have actually partnered up with them to create an actual uh, working system. Um, uh, through a, a working group called GeoWorks, where we're actually utilizing or essentially treating the, the data that we are uh, collecting as a weapon and not in a weapon in, in a traditional sense, but more as in a way to uh, mitigate health hazards, uh, prevent you know exposures to military personnel on the base or civilians, or even identify populations at risk. 
So, and that branches down to the next point of like seeing that, you know, data is power, you know, it, 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 it it provides us this ability to create like a product such as an occupation environmental uh, health site assessment or OISA. This is where we look at conceptual site models, where we uh, build up on uh, collecting the data through either like a tra traditional way of air sampling, you know, digging in the ground and sending the samples to a lab. And, you know, this allows us just to know, you know, just the knowledge of, you know, what risks are out there and what can uh, affect the commander's decision to go forward with um, with an operation. And like I said, for mi uh, mitigating the health hazards and, you know, uh, dictating what the health protection levels need to be, as a lot of people know, uh, on the federal side or in the DOD side, you know, health, uh, uh, excuse me, health protection uh, force measures are, you know, from the COVID-19, the Al or Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta um, stances, like this, um, these initiatives that we are performing with our uh, our civil engineering brothers and sisters, you know, actually drive uh, what, uh, what we need to do in that sense. And then... But yeah, and then I'm now going to hand it over to uh, back over to John, who's going to talk a little bit more about the proactive and planning, which actually yep. uh, feeds into that. And so, <clears throat> talking from the planning perspective in that first phase, you know, we, we talked about how relationships matter. Build those relationships early through your MOUs with local agencies, um, agencies external to your boundaries, and folks that you're working with all the time. Make sure that your ICS structure is built out as well as your continuity of operations plan. Um, you don't want to no think about what you're going to try to do when a disaster is hitting. So these these frameworks really matter. And I think what's important to remember about ICS is, again, this is going to be everybody's second job. Your, your folks may be doing something else and then get brought into a, a, an ICS function that they're not always doing every day. So training is important, making sure that framework's important, and really thinking about your information collection plan. Who's responsible and how does your mission drive that? When we think about as-built data and inventories, you know, prior knowledge of areas matter. Um, as-builts would be very helpful in a um, fire response, active shooter, um, any uh, reimbursements looking at damage assessment, it's good to know what was there, as well as your inventories for your infrastructure, um, knowing where your limitations of your infrastructure are, knowing where your critical points of failure, thinking about where you're going back to maintain things again and again and again is going to give you some hindsight on to where you need to focus your efforts, depending on a response. Something else important is resource typing and staging. Um, your equipment and your people matter, so know their skill sets. Know the type of uh, equipment that you have. And I see a question about ICS. That's an incident command system under the National Response Framework. There's actually free uh, training available for the different classes. It's 100 through 900. The 300 and 400 level can be a little bit more intense with three-day training, but these are some of these you can take online. Um, the 100 level actually just gives you an overview of the ERF and the ICS. Um, talk, talking about mitigation projects, you know, these may be post-disaster, um, but you want to identify those issues up front or identify the damage that has occurred and try to uh, look for funding. Think about projects that can mitigate future um, future effects and think about proactively planning your data collection around these mitigation projects. Then, uh, hi, John. So, and I'm gonna step in just a little bit as well. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, uh, to speak a little bit as well from the Air Force perspective. So for a lot of the military out there, and I know I have a few Bs out there, <laughs> um, we have, uh, we've done this a lot. So like we have to go over MOUs and uh, MOAs, especially for like the uh, the outside communities. Uh, like I was stationed at Robbins Air Force Base. I had to work with uh, the local enforcement uh, uh, officials and everybody like in at Warner Robbins at Macon all the way up in Atlanta at the CDC. So like having a, pr and I had to ensure all those were in place before a disaster occurred. And especially like down there when a lot of hurricanes were 
uh, or is it inside a hurricane zone, just knowing what equipment is there, you know, who, uh, like, like what resources are available for, you know, just cleanup or even just preparation of when a storm hits, you know, really matters. And just having that proactive mindset, you know, like helps us mitigate just so many different issues down the road. Um, and, you know, for us on the bio side, bioenvironmental engineering side, I mean, you know, we have that knowledge, especially for the Air Force. Like we have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of data points that can be used, such as like, you know, like fuel, uh, like fuel systems uh, that we can set, you know, characterize to say this is a hazard that would happen if that fuel farm were to go, you know, south <laughs> uh, from a hurricane or just uh, even something as simple as like, uh, you know, performing like a, a vulnerability assessment on a water tower or something like that, like if the structure is not safe and um, and having all that pre, all that pre-knowledge, that predefined data and giving it to like an expert in this field is crucial in the proactive uh, planning and preparation stages. Thank you, Captain. And I don't think we can really stress that enough. Um, you know, when we hear back from AARs and, you know, post-disaster briefings and reports, there, there's a, a common thread of a, a lack of shared situational awareness and a lack of a common operating picture. Um, and there's a recognition for a need for improvement for data, data collection and planning in those areas, but also the need for investment in that preparation. Um, investment is key to making sure you are covering all your bases in the planning stage proactively. So again, you're talking about some of this data you may not may not think about, but think about data that's contiguous to your boundaries, you know, areas um, for healthcare and your vulnerable populations and demographics, any encroachment into your imaginary surfaces, um, any permits for hazmat or chemicals that you have on, on base. Um, identify hazards external to your boundaries, such as a chemical spill upstream or mining, um, any road closures or current construction that could affect your ability to move logistics or personnel on and off your base. Review ADA and local permitting and NEPA regulations so you know you're in compliance. And it dictates your resiliency construction. Again, mission drives your, your data collection. So think about your mission and what you need. Um, a rapid response team for damage assessment isn't going to need the same set of data as Derek's team in health and human services. So think about your mission. Think about what you need to go and collect. What's important to you? Think about your area. And again, invest in that preparation on this data collection. Think about your mission. Think about who is responsible to collect that data and identify that person, task them with these priorities. Um, again, personnel matter and you need to invest in your personnel as, as well as the collection of the data. Some of the questions, you know, thinking about how to you know, really plan this uh, information collection plan is, is to ask yourself these questions in yellow. Go through this with your stakeholders, um, your leadership, your geospatial team, have them involved early. They can answer the questions or they may have the resources or the connections to bring you what you need without go, having to go and dive down a rabbit hole for it. So I think a key for this is, is while you're preparing, you know, answer these questions as well as have your geospatial team involved every step of the way or at least who you've identified to fulfill these requirements in your ICX structure. During the immediate response, um, again, situational aware situational awareness has been key. Many counties have a um, have an EOC platform that you may be able to connect into and communicate with them in the event of a disaster. Um, the EOC is going to be specific to the scale of the disaster, so think about the regional data you may need or the local data, that site-specific data that we talked about earlier. And you're going to have to make decisions in a split second which is why having this data at your fingertips, having the prior preparation, having the planning data all consolidated through your information collection plan is of the utmost importance. You don't want to wait for data. What you definitely don't want to do is bring your superior data that's 12 hours old. They don't need that. They're going to need something that's right up to the date and current. 
Um, for briefings, you're going to have to provide consolidated data, not the full picture. And think about the required data you're going to need to collect for reporting, whether that is to your superior, to FEMA, to another agency. Um, design your databases up front for any required reporting you know you're going to have to provide. Um, preliminary damage assessment is a great example for municipalities. Uh, having a way to collect that data and quickly provide it to FEMA within 72 hours is critical to beginning the reimbursement process. You can find a lot of this data for facilities on your own base or from your civil engineers, as well as from the property appraiser in your county around, around the base and external to your agencies. And think about who owns an asset versus who maintains an asset. That may not always be the same thing, and especially on bases with uh, multiple missions, multiple branches, there may be a division of responsibility among who maintains or who owns a facility. So think about that ahead of time. Think about how you're going to coordinate that information with one another. Um, think about bringing in things like Builder, if you're in the Air Force, to, to look at your facilities and see where your critical pain points points are in maintaining those facilities, the age of the facilities, and the um, mission dependency of those facilities. Derek? Uh, yes, no, and I want to just, uh, you know, to highlight this because I had a lot of experience in the EOC in my, mil in my military career, uh, briefing commanders and, you know, getting live data versus 12-hour data. And, you know, I just really wanted to, you know, like foot stomp, like just the importance of that and knowing, like, especially in my career field, like we are risk communicators. We are the ones that are going to be briefing, you know, commanders or even the communities about like the life, uh, health and safety, you know, effects of a natural disaster or maybe not us directly, but we will potentially even be giving that to a public affairs officer or we'll be giving it to uh, the commander to brief his commander to the, you know, to as high of the level, you know, as necessary. So, you know, in the EOC, I always had to have like a constant situational awareness and knowing when, uh, you know, when data was either you know, like it, it, like it needed to be shared then or I needed to wait, you know, until I needed to get more. Um, and even in that split second, if new data came in, but it was just not possible for me to brief the commander at that time because I needed to validate it, I would give him maybe that 30 minute old data, but then follow back up, you know, through the correct uh, channels after I validated it, maybe three minutes later and be like, hey, sir, ma'am, this is the newest thing. And, you know, briefings are important as well like that i would say that's a very big thing especially for just the communication aspect of you know for, during the immediate response you want to a lot of times the incident commander or the ic would you know they want you know brevity or they want um like you know that data that represents the situation now not what may represent later or even represent you know from you know an hour before because he's not necessarily concerned about that a lot of the times an incident commander who may be a fire chief, you know, maybe in the process of preventing a you know loss of life. So you don't want to give him um, either way too much data where he cannot make a decision, or you don't want to give him data that's not relevant to that situation. So I just wanted to share that perspective. No, that's a great point. Um, and and keep in mind, there's there's two different types of data, really. There's what we call sort of static data, which mm -hmm. counterintuitively could be live observations of weather or stream flows or hospital capacity, um, services or observations. And then there's reporting data. And that's, you know, data that's made for report generations and distilling, um, distilling data down for distribution. So remember that there's there's sort of categories of data that you may use for analysis, but may not be appropriate for pushing up the chain to your commander. Exactly. You know, in, in, in the aftermath, obviously, you're going to be thinking about if it's a natural disaster, debris management locations and laydown um, to move that debris out of the way to make sure, you know, you're clearing the paths for your critical facilities. Um, something else that we like to think about on the health side is your vulnerable populations. So if you have people on dialysis, um, oxygen, you know, these are, you need to know where those folks are either on the base or around your area. If you're going to be helping with any right of way clearance, make sure your critical facilities are cleared and then start thinking about your vulnerable populations 
cul-de-sacs, areas where it's going to be hard for people to get out if you need to move people off of a base or out of a region. Again, think about reimbursement. How are you going to document this? And how are you going to make sure that all of the time of your personnel and your equipment is accounted for? I think it's valuable to include emergency management in your capital planning efforts for hardening facilities, um, looking at redundancy for your utilities or fiber, or looking at going underground like some bases are doing right now for your electric, um, and then energy modeling and looking at some of these facilities, thinking about um, are we really getting the bang for our buck as we're constructing these new facilities, looking at comparing your energy models to existing uh, capacity, utility capacity, think about um again the bdi mci things that are going to affect your decision on a construction renovation or demolition of your facilities and then you know we really have to talk about the, the differences in, in natural versus man-made um you know your mobility may be much more affected in a natural disaster such as a hurricane or a tornado versus a man-made disaster um, your facilities may be affected differently. So I think you really have to run through a lot of these different scenarios and think about what would be important. You may not be able to predict what is going to happen, but you can be prepared um, from learning from other folks and that proactive planning up front. So some, you know, data that you may not think about um, or have not, haven't been exposed to, but your, your state and local governments are wealths of information. Um, your county EOC may have a lot of information as well as your state DOT. Municipalities also have very localized information. Your ca county property appraiser, cities around your base, um, and then Fish and Game is a place that we are surprisingly using more and more for boat launches, um, knowing where navigable waterways are, things like that that you may not have on your base level, but in the region around you. Um, obviously, things like your critical facilities, evacuation routes, um, thinking about where any staged units are, knowing where those are and how they can respond if you have shifts in what you expected to happen versus what actually happened. Um, I'm a big proponent, again, in situational awareness. So if you have CCTV, if you have an intelligent transportation system, if you have fiber that's allowing you to observe points throughout your installation, that's something that you want to make sure you have access to. Think about your vulnerable utilities. If you have concrete encased conduit or if you have above, you know, overhead power lines, those can be affected. Your floor plans are very important, knowing who is where, um, knowing where your capabilities are and knowing the condition of your facilities. Because we're talking healthcare, you know, a, a capacity of resources in and around the area, whether it's a triage, uh, a field hospital, um, a hospital on base, knowing that capacity, knowing their resources, knowing their level of abilities is important up front. Universities also have a lot of information. I live in Florida. University of Florida and Florida State have great libraries of geospatial data that goes on for days and they can be a great source of information for a regional planning tool. Your environmental data is important. Um, that goes along with infrastructure. If you have a chemical spill, thinking about some of these slow burning um, events like a PFAS contamination or sea level rise, knowing where your critical facilities are and knowing where if they could be affected in some way, shape or form is truly important. There's data specific to the DOD and each branch that the public and civilians may not have access to. And I think that's something to investigate on your end, looking where those resources are. And finally knowing, and I mentioned this before, sort of where your hazmat locations are, their capacity, um, fuels, chemical storage, things of that nature to make sure you have that operational awareness. You know, with, with COVID, we really saw an explosion in the use of GIS and geospatial data by a lot of people. And dashboards were something that we saw everywhere. If you wanted to know on the, the number of cases or positive tests or um, hospital capacity in your region, dashboards were being put out. And, you know, Esri um, actually, who, who makes the GIS software, one of the largest GIS software developers in the country, um, actually put out a template that a lot of people can use 
to create a map and a dashboard by plugging in their data streams and data sources to give more knowledge to people. So we saw an explosion in, in the use of geospatial data over the last you know, two to three years. Um, we're going to show you and talk about Captain Chandler's dashboard in a, in a few minutes, but know that these exist and they're powerful tools for data visualization. That is our main power. It's not about making a, a, a map per se. It's about taking the common operational awareness to situ situational awareness and, and providing powerful data visualization for decisions. Remote sensing, you know, using the latest aerials, um, thinking about thermal for any wildfires in that area, live weather streams are available, um, traffic information on pedestrians or uh, vehicle counts, or again, aerospace traffic, your imaginary surfaces or any restrictions that are in effect um, at the time of the response or the event. So, you know, don't discard remote sensing and LIDAR and those things as data sets you may have in your back pocket for when this happens, or you may have used for analysis for your, your planning ahead of an event. Modeling is another thing, you know, you think about um, making decisions. It's not just about looking at a map, it's, it's making, uh, an, making, bringing together uh, disparate pieces of data to make a, a common operating picture and a decision. So, you know, you can use tools like Hazus, which is downloadable, which actually can predict wind damage on the coast, depending on a facility's age and condition. There are multiple fire risk indices available from the federal government level, as well as drought indices. Um, again, I mentioned looking at your building energy models when you build them versus the actual usage and knowing which facilities are performing, um, identifying those pain points or knowing what may be affected. Um, we're starting to see more use of AI, artificial intelligence for infrastructure failure. Um, I won't go down into that, but it's actually looking at conditions and um, predicting where you may see a failure based on conditions or occurring maintenance. And then again, the cr critical facility planning, uh, making sure you know where your resources are, where your vulnerabilities are, um, where your critical facilities that you have to have up and running, because that's going to be part of the planning, part of the response, as well as part of the recovery. So just a quick little example, you know, um, again, I live in Gainesville, Florida, and north of us is a rural county called Bradford County. Um, and Bradford County, through their EOC, actually attained a grant through the Water Management District and the NRCS um, at the federal level to mitigate uh, flooding on a creek that Hurricane Irma in 2017 had created a number of log jams. And so we really started out using GIS to, you know, these are just some uh, slides of the of the damage throughout the area and as well as flooding to a National Guard base that provided response and uh, assistance to the county during the event. Um, and so the, the plan was to mitigate this flooding for the National Guard base and, and, the, and the stream course to make sure that this didn't happen again. And you can see some of the extent of that flooding. Thank you, David, for putting Hazus up there. I appreciate that link. Some of the things we thought about on the geospatial side as we created a model was, you know, the parcel size for laydown, thinking about some of the contiguous ownership, if it was vacant or public or private land. We needed creek access and road access to clear the debris from the stream. We had to think about zoning and the property use and any security restrictions in and around the area. And what we came up with was a brief model. You know, it wasn't very complicated, but we ranked these parcels saying these are the uh, most advantageous parcels for us to get down to the creek and lay down um, hundreds of tons of debris of log jams. And so we identified these parcels first with the team, um, identified the segments that we would be clearing, ranked each parcel in terms of um, potential and availability to the team. And then I identified the areas where the mitigation was going to be occurring and the access points. Um, and so I think something that's key to take away from this is, you know, not everybody is a GIS user, not everybody is a GIS expert. And so we provided this to the contractor in a KMZ, a Google Earth file, uh, ahead of time. So the contractor could see where these access points were, plan out their project. We actually came in under budget a month ahead of schedule and were able to, um, work on 11 more tributaries on this site because of the prior planning and the, and the, and the savings that we did 
creating this model for the contracting team ahead of time. So I, I really, this actually won a uh, emergency management rural community uh, award uh, project of the year from the American Public Works Agency in Florida. Very proud of this project because it really um, utilized the power of GIS as well as um, creating a huge benefit for the community and the National Guard. And we took out about 500 tons of debris in different sites. And it's really, uh, when you think about what that's equal to, you know, 28 class state motor homes, five orbiters or four locomotive engines. That's a lot of debris. Um, so we had to plan for that and have those lay down sites ready. And we, we were only able to do that through GIS. Again, we talked about the two different types of data for communication. Think about your critical infrastructure right? The towers, it's not just buildings, towers, fiber, utilities. It's site specific to you. It may be levees. It may be a seawall. It may be your redundancy in fiber, but think about what's site specific and what you're going to need for your critical infrastructure on your installation. Don't reinvent the wheel. A lot of this data is out there. So use those frameworks, look for those data sources, have the open communication with your civil engineers, have the open communication with external agencies to get some of this data so you're not spending your time having to build it. Um, and familiarize, familiarize yourself with those resources, either your standardized equipment um, and your facilities condition as it relates to your mission. And so thinking about the base, you know, base support installation from the health side, you know, um, you may have deliveries of people materials, um, additional equipment. You may have to evacuate people from your base and get them there in sort of a staging area. Base may be a target for a bad actor. These are all sorts of things that you need to think about in terms of an event. Where are your triage locations at the, uh, specifically at the event, but are there additional field hospitals being set up to address capacity for the event. And then finally, you know, residential housing. You may have people with critical health needs on base. You may have to evacuate the housing, but understand your housing, understand the housing conditions, understand who is there and what vulnerable po populations you have on base. And Derek's gonna talk a little bit more about his dashboard that he created. Yeah, thank you, John. So, yes, yeah, so as uh, mentioned by uh, David earlier in the beginning of this presentation, so I did do a, uh, an internship with uh, DHHS uh, in Nebraska, and it was really helping their uh, emergency health system, like, you know, create this strategic planning. And it was like looking at, you know, kind of how we discussed already in a lot of these slides, like looking at the local resources, what data is currently present? Is it even updated? Um, and like, can we actually make a determinating uh, factor of like what, um, like of like the mission aspect for each region? Uh, and as you can see right here, so a lot of it is uh, broken down based on, uh, you know, the different types of hospitals. So like the trauma levels, you know, one, two, three, four, and also the specialty clinics. So for example, the state of Nebraska only has two uh, uh, emergency stroke centers. So if an EMS personnel gets a stroke victim that's, you know, in the rural part in the, you know, the northwestern part of the state and their nearest one is in Omaha, Nebraska, which is in the far east central area, they have to understand what's the arrival time on that. And even if there's a bed available. So a lot of this, so a lot of the data consolidation and just the communication between different entities was very crucial to, you know, the created dashboard for emergency personnel and first responders, because uh, typically speaking, they they don't have a lot of time, especially when patients are on board. So having um, just this essentially being uh, brought up and trying to put that put it into their fingertips, such as creating, you know, later on looking at creating a uh, digital application that they could put on their smartphone uh, was very uh, was very crucial. And just knowing what regional support was there, because um, there's a lot of tribal land inside the state and also uh, not necessarily highlighted, but the states surrounding there also had large hospitals that they had a lot of MOUs and MOAs uh, entailed uh, or 
created so that they can bring patients over the uh, state line if need be, if there was no access to care. So it was, uh, this is a, a very good example. So, you know, essentially like what you can do um, uh, with GIS data and how you can utilize it to have a, uh, a better outcome in like health and, and not just health engineering, but just like the uh, healthcare realm. You're on mute, David. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. So just jumping here for MK Baldwin has mentioned a couple of things here, which is in the same lane of what you're talking about with this, this type of data. Um, you know, predicting things and analyzing things as a, as a part of this. And he was talking about Thinking about where you can relocate the impact of personnel, where to create shelter or temporary hospitals, morgues to ensure that it has power and, you know, uh, porta pots or, you know, um, the ability for sanitation. But I, I think this is a really key point is that we've got a number of different things that location intelligence provides. In the case here, it's providing context for planners to understand distance time and distance right not only the specific location but time and distance as a part of that planning factors and it's done well in advance of the disaster right Absolutely. and if it's not how long does it take you to gather all this data find the right tools find the right people um so captain this is a brilliant example um i just wanted to give you props on that because um thank you <laughs> all this talks to all the preparation and the data collection and planning, analyzing, and uh, also uh, making sure we touched on MK Baldwin's comments in the in the chat notes. So anyhow, back over to you guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And yeah, just a little quick plug. Yeah, like the modeling aspect is very crucial for this. So like, again, like for us, like the, the main reason for this was to assist EMS personnel with hospital arrival times and knowing what, what was available and what was not. So it wasn't, it, it, it's building it up in the sense of like to try to make it into as realistic of a of a prediction model as possible. Just you know, this help prevent the loss of that life. So. Thank you. So another example of some you know prior planning is some work being done right now at a Cape Canaveral Space Force Station for Range of the Future. Um, while it's not directly health related, it's considering some of these um emergency responses that may happen so we're thinking about um the quantity distance arcs around fuel storage and uh, a launch pad with a fully loaded rocket on it and what that could affect um that's actually brought in additional permitting and signs on the banana river to make sure that civilians don't stray into that area um, we're thinking about things like sea level rise and floods in this area we're seeing that happen and we're using two and three year um, or uh, two foot, three foot forecasts to look at sea level rise, but not just sea level rise, floodplains and a high tide. We're seeing higher and higher king tides here in Florida. So uh, looking at where these, you know, the next wave of critical facilities will be placed, looking at where these environmental constraints are, looking at where we would not want to put some of these critical facilities um, as part of this planning process and it's happening well ahead of any event, but we're considering it not just in a response format, but in base planning. One that's a little bit down the road is looking at uh, Max Brewer Bridge, which is a huge conduit over to, uh, to the Space Coast from the mainland. And, you know, that there is a lot of erosion going on there. Um, this is what you're looking at here is overall location and then the, uh, the erosion occurring in that deep blue trench and it's a, to a hydrographic survey of the area. And so you know, the hydrographic survey was performed looking at where the, uh, <clears throat> where the erosion was occurring and how to prevent it. And this is another mitigation project ahead of time. Um, and what they're doing right now is putting in seagrass, coastal erosion, and this offshore line of wave attenuation devices. So this is another grant funded project from the county um, that's going in and helping some of this critical infrastructure that leads to Patrick Air Force Base, Cape Canaveral Space Force Station to make sure there is continuity of operations and mobility back and forth. Not just another view and of that mock-up of that 
of that causeway heading over to the island there. And then another, you know, we don't really worry about this in Florida. We don't get snow. Um, but, you know, extreme weather right now, we're seeing extreme weather affecting airfield operations and infrastructure. Um, extreme weather could be cold or hot. It doesn't have to be a hurricane or a tornado. And so we're seeing airfield operations consider winter storms as well as summer events now. And the effect they're going to have on your airfield, your utilities, your facilities with roof inspections. Um, this is all critical stuff to, to, to really think about. And it was brought up by uh, Lieutenant, um, Lieutenant who was working on this with us and the Texas ice storms and winter storms of last year and how that affected base housing and utilities and flooding critical facilities. It was something that hadn't really thought about before. We're not in a flood zone. We're not going to get flooded. Well, if pipes burst, you will. Um, and so knowing that infrastructure and knowing the event that was coming helped them plan that a little bit better and really then think about the damage assessment and recovery to those areas. With that, we're going to stop here. We're available to uh, answer any questions you have. This is a wide ranging topic. Um, we can talk about data, policy, um, case studies, but we really appreciate your time. We're hoping to maybe turn this into a multiple session um, event and answer more detailed questions down the road. But today we wanted to give you an overview of how to use your geospatial data, how to leverage your assets, and some case studies about how it's being used for health, human services, and vulnerable populations, as well as infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, I just wanted to uh, let everybody know that the Q&A session has now begun. Uh, you can use the Q&A tabs in the right hand of your screen to answer those, and they will be curated by a few of us here behind the scenes. Um, we also posted in the chat uh, ICS. There was a question about ICS. John had, had mentioned the answer, but just there's a resource there um, for you to look at if you're interested in, in that training that's provided by FEMA on that topic. So I'm going to start off the Q&A just with a question, and hopefully y'all will uh, add your own and make sure they're hard and nearly impossible to answer. <laughs> the more difficult, the better. Yeah, direct um, those to the captain. <laughs> yeah, direct those to the captain. Uh, good mentoring session. Uh, <laughs> But so for, for either of you, and I think uh, actually let's take this one to John, has the omnipresent consumption of location enabled data in our individual lives? It's on your phone, right? Mm -hmm. How do you get somewhere? I need a coffee. Where's the closest Starbucks? Mm -hmm. uh, has that created a capability blind spot? impacting organizations investment in geospatial capabilities i would say that it has you know one of the things we get as geospatial experts is why can't i do this in google earth um well google earth is locationally based you can add attributes to a location have information but you don't have that analysis and you're not able to bring in disparate formats and really move them into one platform and 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 run that analysis for your most um, holistic cross for decision making. And so while I mentioned, you know, giving a contractor access points for mitigation projects and, and speeding up a contract, I think that works well. I would not recommend an agency depending on Google Earth for making complex decisions about their population, their infrastructure, um, their facilities. What you're going to have is a, a spaghetti map like I call it, without any ability to really um, run back and forth and analyze. Yeah, there's a ton of interesting uh, information that's created during a disaster. But what is compelling? And that can be finding a needle in a haystack if you're not prepared. And that's going back to your information collection plan, that preparation. Um, again, lots of cool things on Google Earth. They're interesting. Mm -hmm. But are they going to compel me into action, right? Do they inform me enough or your, your commander or your uh, incident commander uh, through the ICS program? You'll have a map without a, analysis. Yeah. Right. 
So I got two questions here. These are great First questions. From Alvin, they're not mine. Uh, they're from Andrew, <laughs> once from Andrew Calvin. How do you mitigate the risk of enemy criminals targeting of critical infrastructure or vulnerable populations? Uh, because there's an abundance of geospatial data, that can be a two, uh, two-edged sword. Or, yeah. Did that come across right? Do you understand the question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was paraphrasing this question. Yeah, so. I can take that first, Captain, if you want to. Yeah. Think about an answer on your end, but you know, I, I think for us, I, there is some data that's not out there. I mean, you can't go to your utility, local utility, and say, "Give me all of your fiber and electric." Um, now we've heard stories of substations and distribution stations being targeted. Here in Florida, we had a, a hacking into one of our municipalities, and they started to. Um, adjust the addition of chemicals into the potable water. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we can really guard against it at this point. Um, to be prepared may be the best. I, I think that, you know, uh, there's a lot of different ways we can think about this. You know, drone, uh, the drones affecting uh, Heathrow Airport could be something that happens down the road. Um, there may be a way to intercept those drones. If we think about someone coming on the base and as a bad actor, um, there's there's not many ways to completely prevent that. Um, but you you would hope that sort of the um, the ability to access all of that data would be limited um, infrastructure specifically. Captain, do you want to address that? Yeah, so I mean, you kind of hit on it. So a lot of that information is not necessarily going to be readily available, especially for the DOD side. Um, like, you know, take, for example, at a deployed location, you're not going to get a lot of that information. Uh, but I, I would say probably the biggest mitigation uh, tactics that I've seen is just we look at it in a multi-pronged approach of like how we assess a, a risk or a mitigation. So we look at it at the low end of saying like, well, hey, the data says based on like the, you know, if the wind's blowing in our favor, this is the, you know, like potentially like the least amount to all the way to like the worst case scenario where um, say a train derails and then it has a chlorine, t a chlorine car on there, it ruptures, it explodes, and then there's this 50, you know, 50,000 gallon uh, plume cloud of chlorine that spreads across the whole area. Uh, so a lot of our mitigation efforts go into a lot, like specifically into planning and, you know, in essence, uh, what actually what uh, Baldwin uh, mentioned, the modeling aspect of it is like to look at it and to see, you know, what can be done because at this point, at point, at this point in time, especially if like a someone who's maliciously trying to damage something or cause, uh, you know, harm to life, um, at that point in time, I mean, if if the event were to occur, it's more now about just mitigating what the those negative effects have occurred after, like so, like say, you know, such like say an attack or just an, an incident or an accident. So we have we have another question that that kind of relates to the same discussion. Um, trying to find it here again, but it was talking about uh, the classification of the data, uh, confidential, unclassified information (CUI), um, and and I think that kind of goes with what you were just answering. There are mechanisms in place to protect this information. There are processes, networks law. <laughs> um, so is there potential for, for this data to if it was exposed to the to the world? Could it cause a problem? And then if it does, then how do you manage that? And the question is, if you classify it, I guess, at a certain point, at what time does it make it, you know, too hard for the DOD itself to use it? And or, yeah, or, or, I, for the, or for the federal government because there's the critical infrastructure program, right? So you know, the critical infrastructure of the United States. Same kind of question. Yeah, and that's a good question. It's it. That's where it's kind of like you have to just determine what's, you know, 
what in essence is going to cause you know a national security breach or like cause harm is into a national security realm and which would be most helpful for the public to benefit from like uh a lot of the information that i take in regarding like a you know like a vulnerability assessment of an installation it uh, a lot of it is not even controlled by DOD, but even controlled by private entities. So me going out and doing like a toxic industrial chemical or toxic industrial uh, material like site assessment, like I've had, you know, we, you, you may have to do something as simple as like call the Lay's manufacturing company that's 10 miles down the road to ask them, what do you have? Because uh, now granted, I have to, there's a lot of process that goes into place with that or and um, and maybe if you, you get in to, in to into the good graces of the EPA uh, tier two managers at at state level, so a lot of, like FEMA uh, FEMA uh, personnel or even the uh, like you know fire and rescue they 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 coordinate with a lot of those state officials because they have this large database for that. But it would be something more or less like it, you just. A lot of the data is already out there. I mean, Google has been around forever enough that it's compiled so much that it, but a lot of times uh, when people may ask that question, well, like, you know, how do you transfer a lot of classified information? It's not necessarily that that information isn't public information, you know, public source information that you can just, you know, maybe spend 30 minutes Googling. It's the fact that you compile it and how we uh, rate that based on, like, especially for a health engineering aspect, like, uh, like how it would affect like uh, populations at risk. Yep. And again, there's again, policy and guidance that specifies how to handle that data. So that that's exactly. what protects it, right? Policy, exactly. guidance, procedures, systems, networks, security controls, cybersecurity. So um, great question though. I mean, it's, it's hard. Great question. Uh, it, it is. Uh, it's a very hard topic. You know, you definitely have hit, hit on a chord there. Uh, even for, you know, those within the federal uh, response or the national response framework in the ICS system. Um, we have three more questions and we got three minutes left. Uh, <laughs> we can hang on longer, but I think, you know, we should uh, try to make it the one hour. Um, sure. So we got three questions left. I think um, actually Colonel Peak, uh, <laughs> who's that DHA, Colonel Brian Peak. Uh, has asked a question that um, I think we'll hold uh, for for another location, but he's basically asking about summarizing some Air Force capabilities that are integrating with GeoBase. Um, the, the the fact of the matter is that there are a number of civil uh, civil engineering capabilities, much of it which is found within the GeoBase program, is being leveraged by multiple people. The, the bottom line is that location data built natural infrastructure it's foundational it's common operating data and more than the engineers like like captain uh chandler harris mentioned need that data so there's a lot of work going to to collaborate and then integrate their data um sorry sir he's, he's texting he said thank you but uh <laughs> trying to take care of the boss of uh, one of our presenters. Uh, <laughs> Thank um, you for asking, asking my question. <laughs> so um, this is a great question too from Ben. Ben, please. Give, yep. Give me for train your name. I can't even read it. I, 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 side check. Side check. Is there a standard protocol or best practice guide for coordinating? between military EOC and relevant civilian authorities for coordination of data exchange during emergencies or when making longer term plans like the Max Brewer Bridge example. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a little stab at it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, so like the standard, so Typically speaking, like standard protocol or like best practices, like the best practices for us for the for the federal side is getting those MOUs and MOAs in place. Yep. That that's that's gonna be like I can't. Um, there could be there could literally be a helicopter crash right outside the the military gate, 
However, it's based on jurisdiction. Like unless it's like a federal entity, um, like a like a federal piece of equipment, stuff like that, we would, uh, you know, we can potentially we would have to work through uh, the local um, emergency management committee, or we would have to, uh, uh, or we have to wait for them to be to call upon them. It's it's really de uh, dependent upon how it's uh, written at the local level at least from a federal or military standpoint of that. Like, so the military can't, in essence, rush over to the scene. I mean, obviously, yes, if there's going to be a cause for a loss of life and I'm the, I'm a person that's there that can save someone by dragging them out of a burning car, I will do that. Um, but if it's something of a natural disaster type of aspect, I can't. Um, there are procedures and processes in place for, uh, for requesting uh, those those federal entities, specifically military, to assist the, uh, within the community. And, and Ben, in the case of the Max Brewer Bridge specifically, that just really came from communication between um, Department of Defense, the county. The county has a special um, uh, assessment for saving the Indi Indian River Lagoon, as well as DOT. Um, so it's communication up front and knowing your partners and, and putting your, your plans forth. And it doesn't always work. But um, in this case, it did. Yeah, and also, you know, uh, John had mentioned the National Response Framework and ICS. That literally is the framework. Uh, and then it's tailored, as, as Captain Chandler mentioned, tailored at the local operational level, depending on capabilities and stuff. So also, you know, Defense Support of Civil Authorities is a mission for Department of Defense. And U.S. NORTHCOM has the lead for that and they engage and their subordinate units engage with that national response framework to provide support to um, folks during a disaster. So I hope that helped a little bit. For folks. Mm -hmm. And I believe we have one more question. Yep. Yep. And actually, uh, it's a question that we will, uh, uh, Tay Johannes. Has asked about some GIS resources from the DOD. We'll just hold that off, uh, not the forum to to point out DOD resources um, mm -hmm. for GIS data. But I, I will mention just one thing. It is the um, let me just get their name correct. The Defense Installation Spatial Data Infrastructure, or DISD. If if you're talking about basing. Um, that's a great place to start to, to, to kind of start learning about infrastructure stuff related to uh, installations. And there's some stuff online that you can look at if that answers your question. Okay, I hope it does. Um, gentlemen, participants, thank you. I cannot uh, express enough our gratitude for the time and energy that these two gentlemen took to prepare this as well as the support from from the society of american military engineers yeah, absolutely specifically mr carl locus he is uh one of the only reasons why this was able to take place from the headquarters level and providing that support providing this platform for us to do this if you have any questions please feel free to uh reach out to carl uh locus c l o c u s at saming.org sorry carl uh or myself uh david foster at 372consulting.com and we will help you out get, get you in touch with the right people to answer your questions or if you're looking for resources um we want to thank you all again yeah. for for joining us and i got a few more comments <laughs> there you go webinar uh slides will be available they're available Grab them before you leave. Uh, the webinar will be available within 10 days. And if you're looking for hours, available soon. And do not, absolutely do not forget not miss. the yes. small federal business <laughs> conference is coming up very soon yes. in November in Nashville. So uh, get your country music on and. Uh, Continue to grow your network and, and continue to strengthen the defense of our nation.
So with that, y'all, I'm going to say thank you again. And this concludes our presentation. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, everyone.